Hi, my name is Julie Mixon. I'm an Associate Professor of Photography at Francis Marion University and this week I had the wonderful privilege of teaching photography where art and science converge at Ghost Side Tech. We had a lot of fun this week, did a lot of things uh, ranging from film to digital photography and we learned a lot about how science can be used to make works of art. And I've got a lot of wonderful people inside who are going to tell you all about it, so come on in. Anna number one and in class this week we learned about the origins of photography and how earlier inventions have impacted what we call a camera today. One of those inventions is called the camera obscura. Camera means room or chamber and the word obscura means dark so together they mean dark room and that's what a camera obscura is. It is a completely black room with only one source of light, a small hole in the wall. The light goes through the hole and projects an image on the wall in the room upside down. The cam Camera Obscura did not permanently create images that you could hold, but artists used it to trace objects to correctly record objects in that time. To learn more about Camera Obscuras, we made handheld Camera Obscuras out of Pringles cans. We started by cutting um, it about two inches from the bottom, and after that we taped the parts together. Adding the clear lid in between, finally we punctured a hole in the middle of the bottom of the can. When we went outside and looked through the top of the can, we could see certain objects upside down. Hi, I'm the real Anna one. Um, but pinhole cameras are known to be simple. Um, they consist of a light tight box with one opening on one of the sides. Pinhole image quality can depend on the focal length, the size of the pinhole, and the focal plane. The exposure of the image varies on the size of the pinhole. Pinhole pictures are loved for different reasons. It can be because of their dreamlike appearance, dark edges, motion blur, surreal feeling, and irregular looks or edges. Photography has developed since the beginning. This week, we got to see how we can create the effect of the pinhole image digitally. Hi, William. This week, we made a digital pinhole. What we need for a digital pinhole is a DSLR slash mirrorless camera or a phone camera. After we got our cameras, we get some foil or a can and we cut it. Before, but after we cut it, what we get is a push pin, poke a hole through it, and get some tape. And tape it to the back of the phone or to the or to the bottom of the top of your lens. After you do that, you basically just take a picture and it looks like a fish eye lens and this is one of the pictures. Hi, my name is Journey, and this week we learned about the exposure triangle. And one of them is aperture. Aperture is the control in a lens through which light passes to enter your camera. Depending on how much light you want to let in, there will be a number expressed as f slash 1.4 or f slash 2, and so forth on. 4 slash 1.4 being the biggest, and f slash 36 being the smallest, depending on your camera. Aperture affected the depth of field. Wider aperture gives a shallow depth of field, while smaller aperture creates a greater depth of field. Hi, I'm Mason. Shutter speed is how fast the camera exposes itself to light. The faster the photo is taken, the more clear and sharp objects will be. If a moving object is taken at a low shutter speed, it will appear blurry. One trade-off for the shutter speed is that the higher shutter speed will allow for less time for light to be exposed to the camera, and the picture will appear darker and have overall less quality. Now on to pathfinding. Hi, I'm Millie. Shutter speed is an important aspect of photography, whether it's used to freeze motion or blur it. There's one type of photography that shutter speed is especially vital to. This type is light painting. Light painting is a process of taking a picture in a dark space and using light to paint your subject. It all comes down to shutter speed. When we set it to a longer time, about 15 to 30 seconds, the motions we made blurred together. And by casting light on our subject, the lights would stay in a shot wherever we chose to cast it. This process is often, is often used to let people draw with their light, like you see here. But it can also be used to paint your light, to paint your subjects in a different light, like you see here, which is often harder to do with a faster shutter speed. Anything can be used as a light source, whether it be your phone flashlight or LED lights. 
Just be careful that your room is absent of other light as you can make it. Oh, and yes, you can draw the Mickey, the Disney Mickey ears. Hi, I'm Emily, and one thing we learned this week is that light and light sensitive material is all you need to create an image. One thing that uses this process is a lumen print. Lumen prints use a photographic process where you use pressed plants on light sensitive material to create an image. This process is known as contact printing. Elena will walk you through the process. Hi, I'm Elena and I will walk you through the process of making a lumen print. Lumen print is where you put light sensitive paper, which is photographic paper that is filed on a piece of, on a piece of cardboard. Then put plants on top of the light sensitive paper. Next, you will want to put some glass on top so that the pictures don't move and expose it in the sun for about 30 minutes. This is how a lumen print looks right after you bring it in, and this is how a lumen print looks after it's been fixed. You fix a lumen print for about five minutes and fix it in about another five minutes in um, water. This is another type of contact printing, which is sandotype. And Chase will walk you, will tell you what it is and how it was invented. Hi, my name is Chase and these are cyanotypes. Cyanotypes are an object, typically a plant, pressed onto a piece of paper coated in light sensitive or chemicals. Uh, they were first invented by Sir, Wo Sir William, so, Herschel, uh, Herschel, Herschel, um, and were, and that inspired many other artists to use them, such as Anna Atkins. Uh, cyanotypes were first used by scientific community to catalog different plant species before the advent of modern photo cataloging, but now they are mostly used by artists to show their creativity. Now we will show you how to make a cyanotype. Hey, I'm Jordan. To create a cyanotype image, first you must coat your film paper with chemicals. Once it dries, you'll arrange your plants or objects on the paper and expose it in the sun. We exposed ours for about 15 to 20 minutes, but the time can vary. This is what it will look like typically after the exposure. Next, they're ready to be developed. To do this, you'll soak your prints in running water for at least four minutes to wash off the chemicals. Next, you'll soak it in a tray with water and some added, added hydrogen peroxide for one minute. This is called oxidation. The last step is to soak your prints for five more minutes in running water again. Then you can hang them up to dry and you're done. This is one I made this week. Um, it's finished. And next up is wet cyanotypes. Hi, I'm Lauren and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about wet cyanotypes. Wet cyanotypes are a lot like regular cyanotypes except for one main, main difference in that you make them wet. To make a wet cyanotype, you actually you are going to make a regular cyanotype. You coat your paper, you let it dry, you get your objects and a picture, but right as you are about to place them on the paper, you take water or maybe even a little bit of Windex or something else like that and either coat your paper or your objects with it. Then you just place your objects on the paper and make your cyanotype normally, including fixing it the same way. Doing this process will result in your cyanotype having some very cool and interesting textures and colors once it is done. For reference, here is one of my wet cyanotypes. Cyanotypes can also be made with something called digital negatives, and now on to Abby to tell you more about that. Hi, I'm Abby. I'll be talking about cyanotypes with digital negatives. It all starts by using the same cyanotype process. But instead of putting plants or objects on top, a digital negative is placed. We used the pictures we shot and edited them into digital negatives by making them black and white, then inverting them. Then we printed these onto transparency film. Lastly, we did the rest of the steps like before and created all of these. Up next is Purell transfers. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Cassidy, and today I'm going to be talking about Purell transfers. Basically, we have a clear paper and we have Purell um, hand sanitizer. So whenever the um, hand sanitizer is spread onto paper and then um, put onto with the clear paper, then um, the ink starts to um, be put onto the paper because the alcohol is a solvent. So then as soon as you take away the um, clear paper, um, the ink will all stay on there. Hi, I'm Josh, and if you want to know how to make your very own Purell transfer, what you'll need is a piece of paper, a piece of clear film with your image printed on it, some Purell hand sanitizer, a brayer, and some tape. First, what you'll do is set down your piece of paper on a flat surface and place your film on top in the middle. You'll tape the top side of the film on your paper and your paper to your surface. Then, you'll lift up your film and squirt some hand sanitizer on your paper. With your brayer, you'll roll out your hand sanitizer to make a thin layer that covers the paper. Then, put the film back down on the paper, dry off your brayer, and roll your film onto the paper with the brayer so that the image transfers to the brayer of hand sanitizer and let it dry on the paper. When that's done, remove the film and all the tape, and if you did it right, you should end up with something like this. I'm Maddie, and this week we used a photo editing software called Pixlr to edit our photos. Tools you can use to alter your images include masking and selection. Masking is used to limit where a layer is visible on another layer. You can use the selection tool to select smaller portions of the image to edit rather than editing everything at once. Do using these tools, you can make something called a multiplicity. This edit is made by taking multiple pictures of one subject in different places in one area. These photos are then layered and masked in a way that makes it appear as if there are multiple of one subject in one image, as you can see here in my example. Alright, so you can see we did a lot this week. They worked really hard. I'm very proud of them. And if there's one takeaway from this week that I'd love for them to take with them, it's that we don't make, we don't take photographs, we make, make photographs. photographs. Bye! Bye.